Good morning, everyone. Let's praise the name of our God.
none can compare to your matchless word. Sing to the ancient day. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient day. Nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue, every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow its your throne. We worship you and be exalted. remembers this song. It's been quite a long time. Rejoice in the Lord and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord and again I say Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. Your kindness, your kindness so bounce to the ends of the earth. Your grace and your mercy surrounds us, O oh Lord. Your name is exalted for you. in the Lord and again I say rejoice rejoice in the Lord and again I say rejoice there's healing there's healing deliverance salvation and more the river is poured out for one and for all so come to the river and drink from the water of life. So come to the river and drink from the water of life. Come to the river and drink from the water of life. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord and again I'll say. Sing the Lord and again I say rejoice You're a mighty God You're a mighty God You're an awesome God You're a healing God You're a sovereign God Sing you're a mighty God You're a mighty God you're an awesome God. You're a healing God. You're a sovereign God. Hey, oh, oh, oh. Rejoice in the Lord. Hey, oh, hey, oh. Rejoice in the Lord. Hey, oh, hey, oh. Rejoice in the Lord. Sing 
can't stop it, I went too sweet Who is stirring up my passion? Who is rising up in me? Oh, Lifted us up, 
Out of our sin, Lord, you've lifted us up. Out of our shame, Lord, you've lifted us up. To greater things, Lord. And I will declare your table in a time of communion very shortly. Uh, and as we do this morning, you know, usually we, we really center on the person of Jesus Christ at this time and we do that. But this morning we've been singing to the Ancient of Days. We've been singing to the Lord of all, the three in one, Yahweh. And, uh, and you know, in Genesis it tells us that the three in one were there present at creation. It says that the, the world, it was, it was, it was void and formless, and the Spirit was hovering over the waters. And today on Pentecost Sunday and Shavuot, as we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit given to the church on that that very first day when it was poured out over the church, we're going to celebrate communion, recognizing our God, Yahweh, who is three in one. You know, in the Old Testament, there are more than 300 promises or prophecies given about the coming of Jesus. In recent weeks, we've been talking about the promises of God. More than 300 times through the Old Testament prophets and writers, the coming of Jesus was prophesied, was promised. And Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He came. And, and you know, as, as the Alpha author Nicky Gumbel rightly asserts, he says, you know, a very clever charlatan could have kind of like wrangled himself into the, into the story and kind of made some of those prophecies come true about himself. But then there's so specific about where the Messiah was to be born. <laughs> he says, you know, like, oh, I was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Whoops. No, even down to where Jesus was to be born was prophesied was given to us, and Jesus fulfilled more than 300 prophecies, promises of the Old Testament. And I just, I just feel to share um, these words from Acts this morning. I need three hands sometimes to get my glasses, the Bible, <laughs> and the microphone. In the book of Acts, You know, Jesus fulfilled promises of God, the prophecies of God. But then he says to them, on one occasion while he was eating with them, this is the resurrected Jesus, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And just as Jesus was promised through the Old Testament Scriptures, Jesus promised a gift from His Father, the Holy Spirit. And then a little bit later on in that passage, as Jesus has been 
ascended into heaven. It says that they, the disciples were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men came, two men dressed in white stood among, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So Jesus was promised in the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus himself said, wait until you receive the gift my father has promised. And then the, the, the one more promise is that he will return the same way that he has gone. Yep. And when we take when we take communion, these elements of communion, we take the bread and we take the cup, we are people of the promise. We are people of prophecy. We are the people who step into the story of God, the story of Yahweh, three in one, who is God the same yesterday, today and forever, the God of the first pages of Genesis right through to the last pages of Revelation. And as we take and as we eat and as we drink these elements of Jesus, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns, until he comes again, Jesus said. Whenever you eat and drink this, you are proclaiming my death until he returns. And so as we come this morning, I invite you to come, yes, with an air of remembrance, of celebration, of thankfulness. But I invite you to come with an area of, of expectancy, of promise. As we echo those words in Revelation, you know, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. We wait for you. We look to you. We're not in a hurry. Until you come, we will proclaim your death, your resurrection, your life in and through us. Let me just read you these words from Paul as we prepare to come. And as I look for a third hand, here we go. (laughs) Paul writes to the Corinthians, For what I, I received from the Lord, what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, Yahweh, Jesus, Spirit, we thank you. We bless you. We are so grateful to you, God of the universe, Lord of the heavens and the earth, for coming, for giving us your promises, your prophecies, and not only giving them to us, but fulfilling them in Jesus, for fulfilling them in the Holy Spirit, fulfilling them in the second coming of Christ. And we say with the Spirit and the Bride, Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. In the meantime, we proclaim you. We live you. We demonstrate your kingdom here on earth. And as we eat this bread, we thank you, Lord God, for the body that was given for us, broken. We thank you for the blood that was shed. We thank you, Lord, that through Jesus, there is now no separation of us from you, King, Lord, God, Yahweh. We thank you for your immense mercy, your great grace your wonderful sacrifice. We bless your name and we bless one another as we eat and we drink to your glory. Amen. You're invited to come over the next several minutes as we continue to worship. Come and eat and drink. Remember him, celebrate him, be expectant for him.
end of the age we will behold the King coming in the clouds and all his glory. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Return to us. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Return to us. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, return to us. I believe heaven will open up, the Son of Man will come for us. At the end of the age, we behold the King coming in the clouds in all his glory. I believe heaven will open up, and the Son of Man will come for us. At the end of the age, we behold the King coming in the clouds in all his glory.
of Israel, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth, even to your old age and great hairs, I am he, I am he will, who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. And just when Stu preached on promise a couple of weeks ago, I read this the very next day. And there are different kinds of promises. There's the promise that you say, oh, we'll get ice creams on the way home from church, kids, or I'll take you to the beach next Saturday. But it takes an eternal God to make an eternal promise. It takes an eternal God to make an eternal promise. It's a magnificent story. He has been there all the time even when he was unacknowledged even when we were lost him he was there and his promise he knew you before you were conceived and he made a promise to you to sustain you and most of us here we know we've got grey hairs we have a history with God and when we think about it he has never let us down he has been magnificent in his faithfulness to us.
you high above all their fears and worries, Lord.
for those who come after us. Oh, 
thousand generations and your families and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you from a thousand generations and your families and your children and the children and the children sing his best in your presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he's is you he's is you in the morning in the evening you're and you're going he's with and rejoicing he's for you 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 you sons and daughters we bless you sons and daughters we bless you children and we bless you families now the word says that uh, his people perish because of lack of understanding we know his promise we thank you for knowing your promise Lord and we stand on your promise Jesus and you came to give life and life abundantly we just thank you Father that you um, pour your blessing upon our families upon our children and Father, especially today, I pray for our children's children, the children that are not yet born. And we just pray for your great blessing, that you will just release your blessing upon them even now. <laughs> and we thank you for them, Lord. We thank you for every child that is not yet born, that you desire to be born. And we pray for your protection. We pray that each and every one of them would, um, would make it <laughs> to earth. And we just thank you for the lives that they will live for the, um, the callings that you have upon each of them. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would um, give strategies to us right now as parents, as grandparents, and even as children, that um, you would be building the character and you were building the skills into our lives that would be able to equip uh, the next generation, Lord Jesus, even though they're not even here yet. We just thank you for what you're doing in us, that we'd be able to release your presence in a fuller and deeper way into them. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And we agree on behalf of the children that are coming of age now, that are coming into their strength, Lord God, that are coming into their into their teens, their 20s and 30s, that they will be more than equal to the challenges that this world is presenting, mighty God, simply because, not because they are better than any generation that has come before, but because you remain with them. You go before, you are behind them, you are around them, Lord God. You will remain with them forever. You have promised, Jesus, you have promised, I will be with you to the end of the age, mighty God. And so we, we stand in that promise today, each one of us, 
Whatever our age may be, whether we are yet to be born, whether we are 8 or 28 or 58 or 88, Lord God, or beyond, Lord, we stand in the promise that you made, that you made never to leave us or forsake us, Lord God, to always be with us, Lord God, to be all that we need, to give us an understanding, to make us complete, Lord God, to make us whole, and that out of that wholeness we might live and minister wholeness to the world around us, Father God. And so we renounce brokenness, we renounce fear, we renounce uncertainty, we renounce angst and anger, Lord, all of these things we lay at your feet, and we receive again from from you afresh this morning, wholeness, joy, peace, confidence, expectation, authority to minister the same to everyone around us in quietness and confidence. We minister your peace. We declare your peace. Every situation, every person around us with absolute confidence, Lord, you will have your way. We breathe you in. We breathe you out. Yahweh. 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 Yeshua. Precious Savior. Redeemer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's continue to worship as the Jubilee dancers come and celebrate the faithfulness of God and goodness of God. Yeah. Just uh, just continue in his presence. Stay in his presence. Breathe him in. Breathe him out. This amazing God, this wonderful Savior, this eerie, eerie unrestrictable Redeemer. He will have his way. Battle is yours, the victory is mine. 
Oh, yes. Amen. Everybody say that last line together with me. The victory is mine because the battle is yours. Say it again. The victory is mine because the battle is yours. And this time, do it with a conscious act of surrender regarding all of the issues that you feel it's your responsibility to fix. All right? And you've been batting your head against that brick wall maybe sometimes for years. The victory is mine because the battle is yours. Thank you, Lord. We give it all to you, faithful God. We surrender again and remind ourselves that we are your children. We are not your substitute. We are yours. We are owned and loved and, and uh, passionately pursued. Thank you, Jesus. And not only us, but millions and millions, billions of men and women right around the world, right now, this moment, the Holy Spirit is in pursuit of them. Hallelujah. To set them free. <laughs> Glory to God. Let today be a great day of salvation. Let today be a day unlike any day that has come before it. Let today be the day that we have longed to see and we have waited for and we've heard about and read about and been promised regarding. Lord, let this be the day that, that, that your spirit breaks in a double portion upon the earth uh, in an unprecedented way. Father, shake and wake the nations and millions of people everywhere to the reality of your presence and your love and your power and your grace and your goodness, mighty God. Shatter every false image of so-called gods that have taken your place in the eyes of mankind, Lord God. Let them tumble over like Dagon. Let they be broken at the threshold of your purposes coming to be today, now, in this generation. Hallelujah. And we pray, Lord God, that the power of your Spirit manifest Manifesting through your written word that has been disseminated right through Nambor of, 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 of weeks of late, Lord God, that that Bible, that precious word, that precious gift will find, will, will, it'll be a moment. It will, it will shake and wake. There will be a curiosity. There will be driven by your spirit, a compulsion to open its pages and read and discover who you are and be found to be found, it be, to be in love with you and to be loved by you, mighty God. Let that miraculous encounter take place even today, right now, this beautiful sunny morning. Let a man, a woman, a family be drawn to that word freely given and let your grace freely be poured out upon them today. Father, we look for the transformation of the city of Nambor, of this coast and all the region. Lord God, we look for the transformation of the world to the point that your glory comes covers the earth like the waters, the sea, Lord God. And let it not be a platitude and let it not be something with which we are so familiar that it has become simply Christianese. But Father, we look to you for that day when we too, even we, full of faith, will have our jaws drop open in wonder as we fall to our knees because we see your glory covering the world in a way we never anticipated. Mighty God, not as, another, not as a choice that is winning over several choices, but as an undeniable power of heaven transforming the earth. Thank you, Jesus. Get the glory, Father God. Get all the glory. Fulfill all your words. Satisfy all your heart for all mankind until every knee, every tongue declares Jesus, the Lord Yeshua, he alone, he alone, he alone is God. He alone is Lord. There are no other gods. There are no other gods. Not only shall we not have any other gods before him or put anything in the place of God, but there are no other gods. There are pretenders. Everything else was created at some point. Only God is the eternal one who exists from before time, who is forever the same. Only Jesus. Only the Lord Yahweh. There is no one else. There is no other uh, contender for the throne of heaven. There are presumptions. There are presumptive ones. Foolish, demonic forces taking advantage of the willfulness of humanity in its own stubborn selfishness and waywardness, but only God is God. 
Only Yahweh is God. He has only one son whose name is the Lord Yeshua. There is only one spirit that emanates from that God, the Lord, Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, who has indwelt each one of us and has empowered us to make declarations like this that to the world are absolute foolishness. Tell you what, to the unsaved, if they'd seen what we've sung this morning and heard what we've declared this morning, they'd be scratching their heads. But for the grace of God invading their spirit, bypassing their brain, and giving them testimony, I don't get this at all, but there's something, there's something, there's something, I don't know what it is, but I'm resonating with that. I have no idea, but it's there. Because God has placed eternity in the hearts of all mankind. And it's a lodestone that he draws upon in his timing, when he says it's time, he says that for nations, for epochs, for eras, for ages, he says it for individuals. There are individuals in Nambour this morning for whom God has spoken over them. He said, it's time for you this morning. And we pray for those individuals this morning, Lord God, that they will not miss the, 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 the time of their visitation that they will respond to the unction of your spirit within them, your spirit to their spirit, bypassing all the objections, all the foolishness, all the track record, all the, all the brokenness, all the, all the disappointment, all the bad choices, all the sense of loss, all the cynicism. Hey, that's not a wall that prevents you and keeps you out of an individual's heart. That's simply something to which you give the flick. In Jesus' name, by the blood shed on the cross, you simply move it aside and say, in spite of all that, here I am, and I love you. Father, we pray for those individuals for whom you have said this morning, it's time. Lord God, please, please, thank you, Jesus, by your grace. And we'd, we don't even hardly need to plead, Father, but we'd, what we do is empower your angels who've been sent before to clear the air, to clear the space, to clear the atmosphere, that there is no hindrance, there's no blockage, Lord God, that there is a free and ready access for you into their spirit and into their heart to draw them into your loving embrace, to cause them to be born again today. Thank you, Jesus, for the harvest today, right around the world, one after another, after another, after another, then impacting their family, their parents, their children, their aunts and uncles, their employees and employers, their friends, their workmates, their associates, that spreading fire of the kingdom that will not be quenched. It moves at its... At its preordained pace. It is never frustrated. It is never delayed. It is never detoured. God has his way. That fire is burning today. It's that fire which the dancers danced regarding this morning. I loved seeing the flames filling the vision and that powerful declaration sung by Paul Wilbur. Such an anointing on that and such an anointing on our worship this morning as well. But that fire, if you will, that was ignited 2,000 years ago on the day of Shavuot in Jerusalem, in that upper room that even today is being again identified several layers down from the traditional site. But nonetheless, d discovering now that there very likely was a messianic synagogue after the destruction of the temple placed there oriented toward Golgotha, rather than the temple which was no longer in existence. Fascinating testimonies to the reality of what God has done. Because in our day, generations later, we've become, we've become not cynical, but we have become so accustomed to the good news that it has become over-familiar to us. And we've... We've, we've become so accustomed to reading Scripture as though it were a metaphor. It is certainly full of metaphors, because how else can you describe the indescribable? And how else can you describe the indescribable one but with, the, with a wise and wonderful inspired use of metaphor? But so much of the Word of God is, in fact, literal. It's history, and we've consigned it to to Sunday school and myth 
or maybe not using those words, but we've drifted that direction. And we've lost the impact of the reality of what God has in fact done in time and space. Not the least of which was sending His Son to be just like us. So that through a perfectly lived life, <laughs> I gotta say, I gotta spin that into something, don't I? For those of you who can't see, dragging on the ankle. What could we do with that, Stu? Come on. Come on, there's gotta be something there. Cling to him. Cling to him. But I, I dare say, yeah, for those of you that weren't able to see on live stream, one of, the, one of the moms was going out and their daughter was clinging to their ankle and, and she was dragging them down the, down the aisle. There's really got to be some good message there. Some, come on, Gemma. What, come on, it's there. <laughs> yeah, come on. Yeah, and maybe it is. It's just joy. It's just freedom. It's just liberty. It's just, and it's clinging to Jesus and enjoying the ride. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be back. Hallelujah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. It is good to be home. Yeah, we've been gone for almost seven weeks, I guess now. It seems like, yeah, I guess it has been. Long time, long time. I'm a, little, I'm a little dizzy this morning. I've got to be truthful with you. I'm a little spun out. We got back on Friday morning, but uh, I came back with the dreaded uh, vertigo thing, you know? And um, so if I fall over, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. I remember I was, we were, Ginny and I uh, were, were swimming in the Dead Sea at one point with our daughter Elise, and it hit me, because in the Dead Sea, you, you float, you sit back and you just float, the water sits up to there and you just sit on top of the water, and it's just, it's just so therapeutic and wonderful, and it's just like, <gasps> but the, the, the vertigo thing was there, and the minute I tried to bring my head up, the world spun like mad, and so I'm trying to get out of the water now. You know, and my world is spinning like this. And if you, you, you got to hear me, when you're in the Dead Sea, you do not want to get the water in your eyes. Okay, it is absolutely salinated acid for eyeballs. Okay, and it will, it will, it, it'll ream you out. So I'm, I'm walking like this, trying to get out of this water without, and sure enough, I fell right over. Splash! got soaked and so now I'm up like this and my eyes are burning and the people on shore I'm convinced they think oh that guy had a little too much before lunch <laughs> and one of these tourists you know free booze in the hotel or something and now he's down here making an idiot of himself so I, I found it, managed to get out and get myself to the shower you know and get spun off but um, feeling much better today <laughs> I much tell you and I want to I share some thoughts with you that the Lord gave me while I was sitting on the bus in, uh, in Tel Aviv. We were uh, on our way to pick up a rental car and go do some fun things in Israel. We've had, we've had a journey. We, we saw my mother in Seattle for a couple of weeks, which is wonderful because she and her husband are now going into some assisted care living spaces. But uh, that was launched really by the fact that all four of my of us brothers, the four of us could get together, and I think there was just agreement and blessing and grace on that that freed my mother and her husband to just surrender and say, okay, it's time. And uh, then we spent a week with Noah in California, met all of his friends and saw how he too is thriving in his circumstances there, challenging as they may be, but life, <laughs> life is challenging. Yeah, then we flew off and we spent a week in Wales, uh, as you know, to teach there at, at the Bible College of Wales, and that was wonderful and refreshing. Then we flew off to uh, Israel for two weeks with our daughter Elise and uh, saw all her friends and her special friend and uh, saw her um, carry, you know, succeeding beautifully in school. And uh, um, just it's just wonderful to see our children thrive. And if your children are not thriving, their story is not over. 
and uh, Gretchen prayed for your children this morning. An anointed, timely, powerful prayer for the breakthrough that they are desperate for, even if they don't realize it. Sometimes we just don't know how much we need what we need. And, uh, but the Lord's not done. He is the God of breakthrough. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As a parent, you have to carry that load in a, in a peculiar and unique way. But at the same time, you learn to rest and let the Lord do the heavy lifting for your kids. That's what you do. This is what we do. That's where my mind's going to be going this morning. It's going to be, it's going to be floating all over the place. But there's all good sort of stuff here floating on the surface. So let me just try. Shavuot. Pentecost. Right. The second of the major feasts in Israel's calendar, coming in late spring, setting us up for a summer season, which is prophetically the age of the Gentiles, where God has set his first chosen people aside in mystery and wonder and great grace for punishment while he turns his heart and his attention to a harvest amongst the nations. And you and I are as a consequence of that harvesting action of God. And it sometimes breaks our heart to recognize that it cost Israel immeasurably, unspeakably, that that simple gospel message should come all the way around the globe and catch you and I in its embrace. But thank you, God, that the family you determined would not be complete unless you and I, Gentiles, were included in that family, equal, at the table, loved, immeasurably, along with our elder brother Israel. Yeah. So God at Sinai, to launch this, this whole redemptive strategy, sets his people free from Egypt, and then he draws them around the mountain to himself, and he says, thank you for coming. Glad you're here. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Yahweh, and these are my ways. And we're going to live together. We're going to do a journey together. In fact, we're going to be married and if that marriage is going to work, you have to be like me, and I do not change. So here are your instructions on how to change. And at Sinai, 3,500 years ago, Israel received that revelation with wonder and awe and fire and smoke and earthquake and the mighty blowing of trumpets and great fear. And they took that word willingly. Huh? And then they looked at that revelation. And they said, who can be like him. Who can do it? It's impossible. And for the next 1,500 years between Sinai and Calvary, uh, they were wrestling with this requirement to be like God. It's impossible, but he's required it of us. And you don't mess with this God. You have to approach his requirement, his demands. Otherwise, it's fire and smoke and earthquake. And we've seen enough of what an angry God can accomplish. So, Lord, and we try and we fail and we try and we fail. And once in a while, we succeed seed with David and Solomon and then we try and we fail and we try and we fail and God sends us messengers in the prophets to, re to remind us remember your heart, remember the orphan remember the widow, remember lifestyle remember attitude remember remember, it's not just about performance it's not just about ticking boxes and in our desperation then in the fullness of time we bumped into Jesus and recognized that the story was not over. It didn't end with Sinai. That was God setting us up to take hold of his answer for us who was in Jesus. And it is in Jesus by his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and the gift of his Holy Spirit that the righteous requirements of the law pronounced at Sinai are now fulfilled in us. Romans 8 verse 4. You are now by faith in Jesus, every single one of you, even the, with the least amount of faith, if you have had an encounter with God and you've said, I surrender to you, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior, take hold of my life, I turn around, I repent and want to walk your way. When you have made that, con you've had that encounter with God, they had that conversation, you've uttered that prayer, the cry of your heart has been, Lord, be my Lord. Yeah, then you, by that declaration, are made a lawful citizen of God's kingdom. 
And it is not dependent on your performance or box ticking proficiency, but rather on the surrender of your heart on a daily basis to say, God, it's impossible for me to satisfy the requirements of your law. I now will receive your solution. Faith in Jesus. And now I too am a lawful citizen of your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And having received that, that good news, God then empowers us in Acts chapter 2 to obey, to conform to the utterances and the, and the standard of his character by the gift of his Holy Spirit. Not through lists alone, not through, you know, long lists of, 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 of commandments, but rather through a transformation of your heart that has been, been accomplished and is being accomplished by the gift of the Holy Spirit of God himself resident within you. What a wonder. My goodness. Thank you, Lord Holy Spirit, that you haven't been so offended by my foolishness that you have left. In our prayers beforehand in the service, I think it was Josh that was reminding us that the Holy Spirit so often depicted as a dove, a metaphor, um, coming and, and alighting on individuals, and in most particularly in Jesus, his own baptism. Here comes the Holy Spirit, and, but it says, and it, it, and it remained on him. And Josh's, Josh's comment was that the Holy Spirit is like a dove, but not, not flighty like a bird. Okay, so the minute you step out of line or color outside the lines or get it wrong or, or you know, feed the old man or just have a bad moment, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't just get startled and fly away until you're calm again, you know. So the Holy, that little bird can come. No, the Spirit of God, while he's likened to a dove as a symbol of peace and purity, nevertheless is not like a dove like a bird in character, he comes and he abides. He comes and he remains. And he sees you through thick and thin. And he's not startled by my foolishness. My bad days do not send him running so that I've got to coax him back by good performance. Yeah? Not at all. He's there. Constant. Resident. The conviction, nevertheless, will come then. Therefore, Lord, please let me live today in such a way that I do not offend you and make you regret <laughs> moving in. It just occurred to me, you know, how, what a pain moving house is. How many of you have moved many times? Pretty much everybody. Some of you have had years that you could, you could, you could boast of, you move five times in one year, you know, or in 10 years, you've moved 12 times. You know, we have those stories, and man, it's exhausted. And you know what's even more exhausting? When a good friend of yours says, I'm moving, I could use your help. Uh, uh, I think I'm going to be away that year. <laughs> you know, nobody likes to move. Man, you gotta dump stuff, you gotta clear out the garage, the attic, you know, under the bed, you gotta toss stuff that you thought, one day I would use this, but you never come around. And so we have these resolves. If I haven't used it in a year, I don't need it, you know? And so we, we travel light again, you know, and we move. Good thing the Holy Spirit is not like us. God reproves humanity in Psalm 50. He reproves humanity. He says, You thought that I was just like you. Therefore, I will chastise you in, that, in the context of Psalm 50. In other words, I'm going I'm to I'm rectify that, that misunderstanding. I, God says, am not like you. I don't move. I don't leave when the going gets tough. I abide. I have made a promise to you that, that Stu preached on a couple of weeks ago. I have a promise. I've made a promise to you. and I do not break my promises. I am a faithful God. Even when you are faithless, I remain faithful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that I have not somehow given you cause to depart from me. Thank you, Jesus. Curious prayer that David prayed, wasn't it? 
Lord, let your Holy Spirit take not your Holy Spirit from me. Thank you, whoever reminded me of the King James Version. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, as if God would. As if God would. But that's the fear of our hearts, that somehow we've so offended God that he's, 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 he's backed off for a while just to prove us, prove, prove to us that we can't do it without him. No, no. The Spirit of God is there. Be aware of it. And it's not, it's not a week's worth of good performance that will coax him back into your life because he's never left. What it is, is repentance on a daily, joy-filled basis. A just course. Remind yourself, oh, I'm a son of heaven. I'm a daughter of the king. I have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let me live as one who is aware of the nobility that has been conferred upon my life and thereby be an influence to the people around me. Not in pride and, you know, haughtiness, but in authentic, humble power and authority. I was on the beach at Jaffa. Ginny and I were swimming off the, while well, I was swimming. Ginny didn't go in that time. And I was just treading water in the, in the small surf uh, off the beach of Jaffa, which is, which is a beach really that extends between Tel Aviv and the old city of Jaffa. It's very beautiful. And uh, the old city is still there on a hill built up and uh, very picturesque. But as I was treading water, all of a sudden the thought came to me, my word, you know, how many times have I been to Israel and, uh, and taken tours, etc. But this time, the impact of the reality of the history, not the myth, but the history of Peter being on Simon the Tanner's rooftop right there somewhere, even though there is a door that says Simon the Tanner's house <laughs> that tourists get to visit and a roof that you can go up on. Simon's house was probably, you know, 20 feet below the surface somewhere in the day, and who knows exactly where, but it was there that that vision came to Peter that broke down the barrier, that kicked open the door that was closed upon the rest of the world, the nations of the world, and Peter was given to understand that what God calls clean is clean. And so he was prepared and set up to accept the invitation of Cornelius' servants to go up to Caesarea. Um, oh, you know, half a, you know, a couple hours, you know, an hour's drive up north of Tel Aviv. Not quite an hour's drive, 45 minutes. And, uh, but he walked, so it would take him a, a day or two to get up there. And then to go into the house and have that encounter which, with which we're all familiar from Acts chapter 10, where Peter, he's going, I don't know why I'm here, but okay, I'm here. And he just, what, this is what I do. And he starts preaching the gospel. And then I love the description in Acts 10 where, where it says, well, let me, just, let me just read that quickly for you. It says, in, it, it's just wonderful. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, in other words, didn't wait for Peter to finish and come to his, his conclusion and have an altar call. There were no boxes to tick here. It was the, it, can you sense the urgency of God, the passion of God to pour out his spirit upon all of us, not just the Jewish believers in that upper room and those that became associated with him, but also men and women from the nations who had no, no inkling so it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers, the Jewish believers, who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. What? In the same way that we had experienced back in the upper room on the day of Shavuot. Satisfying the metaphor of the law now placed in our hearts. What a wonder. He kicks open the door and says, this is for all of humanity. And you and I were included in that cry. And in that moment, as it were, we were there. You were in Cornelius' living room 
when the Holy Spirit fell, God saw you. He knew you in the same way that Gretchen prayed for unyet, yet unborn children. God has known you from before time began. And your date, your appointed time was in a sense marked and set apart on that day when Gentiles were added to the house through the goodness of God who didn't even wait for Peter's sermon to finish. Wouldn't it be great, Stu, if all we had to do was stand up here and get through the introduction and then the Holy Spirit falls and then we're, and we're done for the day. And wouldn't you all love that? Because sometimes pastors stand up here and they just, they're just trying too hard. They're just trying too hard to get something going, to make something happen, to, to convince God to break upon us when, you know, and that's all foolishness. It really is. What we are given to do is to speak the mind, the heart of God as we're given to understand it, to share it with you by way of encouragement and in all of that. Lord, Holy Spirit, please come. Holy Spirit, please come. Minister, strengthen, redirect, anoint, mark, mark your people. Yeah. I was drawn in my thoughts to, um, to Matthew 4, um, when Ginny and I and Elise were in the car and we were driving up to Galilee. We decided, heck, rent a car, let's go to Galilee. Isn't that fun? Went to, you know, yeah, I went to the Galilee for the weekend. You know, didn't, actually went for the day. I just drove up to Galilee, went to the sea, because I wanted to see the sea, because the sea is full, has been for a little while now, but I haven't seen it full. The last time I saw the Sea of Galilee, it was dangerously low unprecedentedly low and it was losing water at, a, at a, an alarming rate but with the with the winters of late the Sea of Galilee is now brim full and beautiful flush whole life-giving at exactly a time when it seems the Euphrates River is, is dangerously drying up making way for the kings of the east perhaps for those of you familiar with the scripture, Syria, Iran are, are, are in water crisis. And we in Australia know a little bit about water crisis because it's either too much or too little here. And I gather, although I don't know, I'm, while I was away, you had a little bit of rain. <laughs> Everybody's, you know, complaining about the rain. I go, what's wrong with a little bit of rain? You notice that Ginny and I brought the sun with us. You notice we arrived on Friday morning, and what a day Friday was. It was a, one of those days that arriving like we did, they go, what rain? <laughs> but I hear the rain's coming back. That's what they say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Life. Come on, life. Thank you, Jesus. Just be with all those that have been impacted by flooding and loss. Yeah. So I'm on the way to Galilee, and we're, and we're driving up to Galilee, and it occurred to me, you know what, I'd never really pursued, what does Galilee mean? You know, I mean, all of us are familiar with the, with the phrase that is used in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus, um, well, the description is being given by Matthew, and he's quoting from Isaiah, but let me just read. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody... He withdrew into Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He came and settled in Capernaum, right? So he makes his base of operations there in the heart of the Galilee, at the city of Capernaum, right on the shore, the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. People were sitting in darkness, saw a great light. Those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was John's message. John ended with that message. Jesus begins with the same message. He takes the baton from John and proclaims the exact same um, gospel message. Repent. Not mea culpa, beat your chest, get down, oh, woe is me, what worm am I, but rather a just course, turn around, recognize there's a better way to live, and there's one to help you to live it, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. 
So we're on the way to Galilee, and I'm wondering, what does Galilee mean? And so Elise is in the back seat, and so she Googles Galilee or whatever she did. And of course, you know, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but it comes from a couple words. Uh, one, of the, one of the words related to Galilee is galal, galal, which means cylinder or round. In fact, the word f there's a word very similar to that. I, I saw no irreverence intended here, but I was in the bathroom after we'd been to Galilee, and I looked over and I saw the packet that contained all the toilet rolls. And the, the brand on it was Galilim. And I'm thinking, Galilee, oh, rolls, you know, Galil, Galilee, rolls, Galal, it means cylinder or roll or circle. And one of the reasons it was called the Galil in Hebrew, Galilee in adulterated Hebrew, is because the region of Galilee, of all the regions of the Holy Land, as we've understood it historically, the Galil had very unmarked edges. Um, very indistinct borders. It was, it was kind of, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, frayed at the edges. You didn't know really where the Galilee began and ended. And so it was a kind of an area, a circle, a region um, that was poorly defined, but it included the tribal areas of Zebulun and Naphtali. And Jesus chooses to begin his ministry right there in the heart of the Galilee. And I and I wonder if, obviously, that wasn't intentional, because he begins preaching, repent for what? The what? Kingdom is at hand. He begins preaching a new kingdom, right in a place where the people, especially living in the city of Capernaum and on the plain of Canaret on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is only a few kilometers wide, bordered in by the sea and by rough mountains. So there's a very narrow plain of habitable land right there. And it's also the most convenient passage for every invading army that ever went north or south using Israel as a, as a way. So every invading army from the north would come south on their way to Egypt, and on their way they would cross over the plain of Canaret where the city of Capernaum was. Every army in response going north from Egypt in battle with the Assyrians or Syria or the Seleucid Empire would cross uh, necessarily across the plain of Galilee because every other way in the Galilee was impassable to armies. And so the people of Capernaum knew exactly what a new kingdom coming meant. They had a long historical memory of suffering, of loss, of destruction, and all of the horror of ancient warfare was very familiar to them. It wasn't ancient ideas or long-ago memories. It was last week. So in their minds, Jesus now comes on the scene, and he begins preaching a new kingdom coming, and I guarantee he got their attention. I guarantee with that pronouncement, they stopped, and their ears perked, and their hearts started beating faster, not with, not with uh, joy at first, but rather with fear. But he got their attention using their historic reality, and he said, but not a kingdom such as you have understood or experienced in times past, but a new kingdom of love and laughter and liberty and life and all that is required of you is surrender and all of a sudden, this good news, this gospel message took hold like a wildfire in, in dry brush of the Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles. Why is it called that? Was it, was it occupied pre by Gentiles? Well, in part, across the sea, yes. But many, many Jewish people, and of course, Jesus begins his ministry amongst Jewish people in synagogues. But nevertheless, he, he purposefully, prophetically, positioned himself in the heart of Galilee of the Gentiles and announced a kingdom that was about to come. A kingdom that has, if you will, frayed edges where it's, it's, it's hard to describe where it begins and ends. And so Jesus describes later in his preaching that the kingdom of God is what? Like a lump of yeast placed in the dough and the dough rises. Once the dough rises, if I asked you the question, can you point out the yeast? And the answer would be, well, no. It's become part of it. So it's, it's almost hard to define. Where's the kingdom in that bread? Well, it's the yeast. Well, wait a second, where's the yeast? Well, I don't know, it's the bread. And so we have this area of Galilee that serves 
as a metaphor, as an illustration of the kingdom of God that would explode and burst beyond the defined borders of, of Israel and Judaism and begin to embrace the nations. And where does it begin and end? Well, it's very difficult to say today, though we might say that the cutting edge, the advancing edge of the gospel still is in Asia as it starts to look its way home from where it was birthed in Jerusalem. But it's, 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 it's there. It's in Nambour. It's on the Sunshine Coast. The yeast is there. The kingdom is there. The salt is there. The testimony is there. The passion of God is there waiting to hijack a life this morning. Hallelujah. There's somebody for whom God has said, it's time today. And that, that, that kingdom is going to invade their life today. God bless them right now, wherever they are, with a, with a surrendered spirit, Lord God, that they might know your love and joy right now. Regardless of the strategies of the enemy to distract, break through, break through, silence the objections of their mind right now, and let them surrender, let them fall back into your love, because they are loved. You are loved. If you're watching this morning and you've never surrendered to Jesus, hear me, you are loved with an everlasting love by the one who made you whose name is love. The Bible says God is love. It's well beyond God loves. He is love. He is love itself. And any love that we experience or engage in is some, sometimes, if you will, a poor reflection of the reality of who he is, not what he does. So he's placed his spirit in us. That yeast of the kingdom is in you growing, transforming you, causing you to become more and more like him. Therefore, it's not about you loving well, although it is, but it's about you becoming like he is, becoming love. Matthew was quoting from from Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going to read that chapter for you. It's not a very long chapter. I'm not going to read the whole thing, or will I? Verse 1 of chapter 9, Isaiah. But there will be no more gloom. Everybody say amen. For her who is in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. Can we... Prophetically, one of the layers of the reality of that verse is that f there was a time when God was solely attentive to Israel in intimacy in ways that the nations had no inkling. He was dealing with the nations historically, but only Israel did he reveal himself to in the detail that produced the gospel goodness of Jesus Christ. And so in that sense, the nations were treated with contempt by God because he says in Amos, only you, Israel, have me among all the families of the earth. Only you have me. He goes on to say, therefore, I will punish you for your sins. That's another story. But later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. You and I are sitting here as part of that glorious strategy of God amongst the Gentiles where Jesus began his ministry. Remarkable. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in dark land, will, a light will shine on them. They shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence. Are you glad in the presence of God? Now, these words speak directly. These are written to Israel. But I believe in the nature of the prophetic, there is a layer in which this is satisfied and, a pro and, 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 and describes the experience of the Gentile nations, you and I, who have become glad in his presence. In fact, in, in chapter 3 of Isaiah and verse 8, I'm just going to read that quickly for you. It says here, chapter 3, Song of Solomon, also a good book. Read it sometime. 
Chapter 3, for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. But rather than rebelling against the presence of God, you and I have become glad in the presence of God. We celebrate the presence of God. We anticipate, we step into, we we revel in the presence of God. We've almost become so accustomed that on a given Sunday where we gather together with the other saints, where there's a, a peculiar anointing that comes only when the people of God gather together and the presence of God comes, we expect his presence. And when his presence is, is thin or hard to discern, we go away. Can I say this? We would go away hungry. We go away hungry because we've known what the presence of God, we celebrate, we revel in, we glory in the presence of God. We are glad in his presence, as with the gladness of harvest. And Shavuot is the first harvest festival. It is when the barley is brought in and the wheat begins to be harvested. This is a harvest festival and it brings gladness. And when that Holy Spirit comes and the presence of God comes, we rejoice as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian." Let any burden you're carrying on your shoulders this morning be broken off in Jesus' name. I want you to be able to stand up with a, with, with a sense of lightness and expectation. Yeah, not carrying that unrequired burden. Yeah, Jesus says, if you're burdened and heavy laden, come to me, right? And I will give you rest, right? For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So there is a yoke to be born of Jesus. But that yoke, in a sense, I've often thought it, it looks much more like the arm of Jesus around our shoulders. So he's got the real heavy job. He's doing all the major lifting, but we get to go with him. And that's the burden. What is that burden? Intimacy with Jesus. Trust in Jesus. What is, where is he going? That's where you go. What's he saying? Imitate what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The seal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And you and I are evidence of the zeal of God to have the nations in the family and to have that family then whole, Jew and Gentile together, forming into what no man has ever seen, one new man, neither Jew nor Gentile. What a day. And it's coming. It's coming. As you and I become more and more sensitive to the family into which we've been grafted and Israel becomes more and more sensitive to the Lord, the Holy Spirit and the, and the reign of Yeshua as Messiah. Coming together from different sides of the house, as it were, from different perspectives of, of God's character. One day we're going to find ourselves embracing and as we are made whole, the testimony of God will be made whole as never before and it will go out irresistibly to the earth. In a, in, a, in a revival that eclipses every revival, yeah? This word, Galilee, coming from Galal, also finds a root in another Hebrew word, Gil. And you've heard me teach on Gil before. Well, maybe you haven't. But one of the Psalms that escapes me right now says, um, uh, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. The word for rejoice in that particular verse is the Hebrew word Gil, which actually means to spin. And I love the idea then that comes from that, that the best way we rejoice is by doing what we were created to do. The earth doesn't bounce when it rejoices, or maybe it has in the past. They say the poles have been reversed at some time in history. Maybe that was the earth really going for it and just bouncing. <laughs> But here it says the earth rejoices. How does the earth rejoice? It simply spins. It does what God created it to do, and it does it perfectly. So much so that we take it for granted. But without that spin, we wouldn't be here. 
Yeah? And without what you were created to do, God's purposes will fail in some way, shape, or form. And he'll have to bring another one in to replace you. Let that not be the case. Let that not be your story. Lord, yeah, for such a time as this, here I am. What am I created to do? Declare the goodness of God who brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Be a source of joy and peace to the people around me. In spite of the brokenness of my life and my choices and my track record and my history and my supposed prospects, I choose choose by faith to stand into promise, to stand into the possibility that you, you can change my future. You can change my present. You can redeem even the worst of my, of my choices, God. And I repent, I repent, I repent. Lord God, I turn, I turn, I turn. Well, not with mea culpa, and, but with great joy and expectation, because this is what you've given us to do. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus preaches a new kingdom age, and when gil is used as a noun and not a verb, the verb is to spin. But the noun gil speaks of an age, an age, yeah, a kingdom age. In your experience and mine, the age of the Gentiles, these last 2,000 years where the gospel has been circumnavigating the globe and reaping a harvest that is still to come to its full climax, whereby God makes all things whole, yeah, this kingdom age that Jesus began preaching 2,000 years ago is still advancing, still rising in the dough, still moving forward inexorably. Yeah. And so we come today to Shavuot. You remember Passover 50 days ago? Yeah, we had a wonderful Passover service here. And we were reminded of things with which we are very familiar. Thank you, Lord, that we're becoming familiar in the best sense of the word, not in the, not in the demeaning sense of the word, right? Isn't it wonderful to be familiar with the things of God in the best sense of the word? Not uh, despising, but just knowing, being familiar. Thank you, Jesus. So at Passover, we have unleavened bread. And in that case, in that particular case, as in most references to yeast, barring Jesus' reference to the kingdom, yeast speaks of sin. And so to have unleavened bread speaks of the command or the demand or the requirement of, uh, of holiness in our lives. And so the bread remains unleavened, having surrendered to that and eaten as we have this morning, born out of Passover, the, the, the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus, the unleavened bread and the crushed grape that remind us of that miracle, of that purchase, of that transformation transformative power of God in our lives to make us like him. We've taken that unleavened bread and we've said, yes, God, I repent. May, I, may my life increasingly be sinless, not by my effort, but by your goodness, by your residence within me. And so God says, all right, I will answer that prayer. And now at Shavuot, we come and we celebrate that gift, the promise of the Father, of the Holy Spirit. And it's celebrated in the synagogue, not with unleavened bread, but with leavened bread. And braided loaves have become the, the tradition in the synagogue for several hundred years now. And these are waved before the Lord in the synagogue. So we've gone from unleavened bread to leavened bread. Now, not speaking of sin, but kingdom. Now, speaking of the power of God that is resonant within me, like yeast growing within me. And when I say yeast, I know that there are... <laughs> Never mind. Leaven, shall we say. Yeah, There's leaven in us. And it's at work as you sit here right now. Even now. It's at work. Take heart in that. You are becoming more like Jesus as you sit. As you sit. As you worship on a Sunday, as you work on a Monday, you're becoming more like Jesus because leaven will not be, it doesn't have a day off. It's just cooking. It's cooking. And one day God's going to say, ha, it's done. It's done. And he's going to pull it out of the oven. And after Shavuot, what is the third of the major feasts of Israel? In the autumn? What is it? Tabernacles. Sukkot. Right? We have Passover, unleavened bread, Shavuot, leavened bread now coming, coming to readiness. Now when it's ready, we come to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a feast. Pull that bread out of the oven and let's have a feast together. You see where God is taking us. Yeah, We're on the move. 
It's not static. Yeah. And he's getting it done. He is having his way. Yeah. We're moving from, as we've said many, many times in the past, from the age of Pentecost to the age of tabernacles, from the church age to the kingdom age. And you, I, I like to repeat this. Why? Because we are the generation who gets to see that. Because many of us are old enough to know, we grew up in church, and church was fairly static, and it was what it would be, and the denominations were what they were, and this is what... And, and now we've lived to see, oh, we don't really have a whole lot of skin in the game in terms of denominations. Do you understand the phrase skin in the game? Yeah. Okay. We're not really vested in the denominational system, it, only insofar as it preserves the truths of God and we honor the past and what God has done by way of revival in each of those denominational origins. But we don't live there. We keep moving with God, moving with his kingdom. Yeah. So we are the generation that gets to bridge that from the church age into the kingdom age, whereby we now commonly we describe churches like our own as a kingdom church. Yeah? And we didn't even invent the term. It was the one that came to mind when we're going, well, what kind of church are you at Flame Tree? Ah, okay, I guess we're a kingdom church. And now more and more we find that globally to be the case. And so, and we're moving from Pentecost, which we honor and celebrate. Even today we remember that God graciously poured out his spirit like tongues of fire upon the 120 in the upper room. And, and what a wonder that was and how astonishing it was for those that were gathered. And then he took that same spirit to the Gentiles. Thank you, Jesus, that your spirit now abides within us, each one of us, like a fire, like leaven, cooking, coming to Readiness, yeah? But we know we're on the way from Pentecost, not abandoning the lessons of Pentecost, but taking them with us. We're on the way to tabernacles. What is tabernacles? We are glad in your presence. We celebrate the presence of God, the abiding presence of God, who tabernacles among men forever, never to leave, no more crying or mourning or pain or sorrow from Revelation. That's where we're going. That day is going to happen. It is going to happen. Jesus' feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives. That day will come about. There are things yet to be uh, to transpire, absolutely, and they are, see them as birth pangs. Do not become distracted in these days by the birth pangs. Israel is a hard place to live, and I was reminded of that in our little brief two-week stay. It's hard. you got to push. you got to... I mean, literally, you have to push pretty much everywhere. And, uh, and no never means no. It just means how bad do you want it? And, and yet they're the most wonderful people. Getting to know Israelis is like cutting into fruit. That's why they're called sabras in the vernacular, which is a prickly pear fruit, the cactus. It's prickly on the outside, but sweet and juicy on the inside. So you got to just hang in there long enough. And once you have Israeli friends, you have friends for life. It's, they're just beautiful people, but an eclectic people, and they're, they're, they're Russians and Ethiopians and, and Germans and Poles and, and Yemen, Yemenis and Iranians and Moroccans, and, the, and, and they're all there, and they're all living, and it's full of life and color, and there's, a, there's this desperate need to protect them and to guard the borders when it seems like not the, just the surrounding nations but the entire world is against them. To, to, to protect that precious people is a struggle and it comes with birth pangs. And so too for you and I there are birth pangs in the church and so do not be distracted by the issues of the day for the issues of the kingdom, holiness, unity, God's presence, joy of God, the gospel news, yeah? Those issues far uh, are far superior to the issues of the day. And that is why this book has very little to say about the issues of the particular day in which the books were written. It has very much to say about the issues of the kingdom. And in every age, every gil that has come and gone, there have been issues. There have been antichrist spirits at work. There have been life-threatening existential challenges for humanity. But here... God says, keep your eyes up. Do what is required of you. Do the business of life in your generation, but do not be so distracted that that becomes all you see. 
okay, I better quit. Okay. Because it's time. It's past time. Let me just stop this end by saying this, guys. Oh, what do I want to say? You know, that's a great phrase. <laughs> it sets you up for the, the great piece of wisdom at the end of my message when I'm going, ah. uh, Number one, I want to say two things. One, quick. When Israel went out, they went out just as Jews. They were a, a, a unique race in the earth. All right? Probably all looked very similar. If you even add in David's supposed ruddiness, if that means red hair. But they, all, they were a particular race of humanity. 2,000 years later, when they've come back, they carry the DNA of all of humanity. They represent you and I. We, can I say this? Do you understand this? We are represented in Jerusalem. The it, Jewish people went out, but the nations have come back. And the nations are making up that family of Israel. And to that family, you and I belong. And we are represented in Jerusalem. We are there with our elder brother. Scientifically, in the DNA, and also, and more importantly, by, by the Spirit. Yeah. So we celebrate that this morning. We thank God for his goodness and his grace. I would invite you this week um, to read the book of Ruth. Um, Israel and the synagogue are reading the book of Ruth. Every Shavuot, they read the book of Ruth, which took place during the, you know, primarily over the, the, the course of Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost. And it's a book that I was tempted to teach this morning, but God burdened me with these ideas. And so maybe another time, I love teaching the book of Ruth. But you know it speaks metaphorically of the one new man, Jew and Gentile coming together in the service of one another helping one another into wholeness and legacy, brilliance and beauty. Thank you, Jesus. Please, read the book of Ruth this week. Okay, even read it. Read it sometime between, between now and tomorrow night. Because today, Shavuot in the Jewish calendar began at sundown last night. It ends at sundown tonight. So read it sometime but it's cool. I just like the idea of you and I intentionally sitting down, reading Ruth at the same time our older brother are literally reading Ruth right around the world. One new man in Jesus' name. Father, finish what you've begun. We celebrate your goodness and the mystery and the wonder of your ways and the beauty of your word. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are dwelling in us never to depart. Thank you, Jesus, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So as you encourage us, each of us in our individual lives, so too, Lord God, we raise our gaze. While you see to our issues, Lord God, we ask you to burden us, as, as it were, with, a, with an easy yoke an understanding of your issues. What is on your heart, God? What can we do to further your kingdom and your purposes? And let us do it, Father God, out of, with peace and with joy, with confidence and authority, Father God, because you have made us who we are. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.